to have it here. Okay, very good. So uh, uh, we are very happy to have uh, Andreas Lucas today here from EPFL, and he is going to talk about Erdish and neural networks, which seems uh, extremely interesting to me. The first time I heard it, I, I you know I told myself that we have to hear this guy. So here you go. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Yes, I, I'm talking about like a merge between combinatorial optimization and learning. This is the talk. And particularly, I'm interested in uh, the types of problems that are written in this uh, form generally, that uh, you have a, a graph that's usually your input. I'm a graph person. Uh, that's why maybe I'm focusing on this. Um, so you're looking for a set, usually it's a set of nodes or edges, um, and you, you want the set to have a small cost uh, under the cost function f. And at the same time, you have some constraints that you want to satisfy. Uh, a lot of different types of problems, classical problems of computer science fall in this category. Uh, for instance, if you care about clicks, the maximum click problem is a classical instance. You care about finding a set that has a large cardinality and at the same time, it forms a click. So here, omega would be the set of all possible clicks in the graph. And I remember a click is a set where every node is pairwise connected on the graph. Other things like uh, maximum or minimum cut, uh, vertex cover, independent set, traveling salesperson, they're all, they all can be written in this form. Uh, and of course, these are very well studied problems and usually the, they're NP hard. And we know very various solutions. People have been working on it for a long time. We know that uh, we have polynomial time algorithms for special cases. Uh, approximation algorithms are possible sometimes. You can use greedy algorithms, heuristics, uh, MIP solvers. There are lots of things that you can do. At the same time, I'm here to talk about machine learning and specifically neural networks. Uh, so you could ask why. Why would you solve these uh, well-studied problems in this way? Uh, there are three reasons that people really usually um, bring up. And my favorite is the, the third one. Um, the first is that uh, basically if you are able to learn algorithms rather than design them yourself, uh, perhaps uh, you know you avoid the need for expert knowledge. Okay. The, the second reason is that these problems are hard in, and and you know we cannot hope to solve them in the worst case, but perhaps we can uh, learn distribution specific solvers. So we can exploit the patterns in data in order to find better algorithms for these situations. And uh, neural networks are very efficient at cut, catching up patterns in data, so perhaps they can do better than humans in this. And the third is that we're increasingly, rely, increasingly relying on neural networks um, to solve problems. And th they have been designed to do pattern recognition. They're very good at this, but at the same time, we want them to do more. They, we want them to make complex decisions. And I think if, if we want them to do some kind of reasoning, uh, thinking about combinatorial optimization is a very nice playground. Okay, and perhaps we can bring insights from uh, other communities to deep learning. Okay, a historical overview. This idea of merging neural networks and machine learning with uh, combinatorial optimization is not new. We traced it back to, the, to 1985, where there's this seminal paper by Hopfield and Tank that said, let's solve the traveling salesperson problem with uh, the neural network of the time. This is a hopeful network. And this created a lot of excitement because uh, it could solve some, some simple instances. Uh, but people, uh, after around 10, 15 years of working on this, I think they, my understanding is they, they hit some roadblocks. Uh, they could not scale uh, these, uh, these neural networks to solve bigger instances, they're unstable. So they kind of forgot about this. And then uh, in a little bit more modern times with uh, more modern reincarnation of deep learning, people started to think about how to solve algorithmic problems. This paper is, um, uh, it's, it's not doing exactly combinatorial optimization, but the, the author said, okay, let's so use attention is a type of neural network to, to reason about orders of sequences. And, um, for instance, to learn sorting algorithms or learn to find convex hulls. And this, they saw that neural network could do, not perfectly, could, could not solve this perfectly, but they could do something. And then this inspired people to think about this more. Uh, a lot of different things happened. Then reinforcement learning became a big deal. People started to use RL, for instance, to solve Go and other 
complicated problems. So that started to appear. Uh, we also have specialized neural network architectures that are very efficient to, for graphs. Uh, uh, I call them GNN, so graph neural networks. And people thought that, okay, these are a very good match for these problems because it seems that they also have connections to classical algorithms or frameworks that people have used, for instance, to believe propagation for solving satisfiability problems or to local uh, algorithms in distributed computing. So GNNs, you can use, see them as parametric versions of these frameworks. And, and then last, uh, in the in perhaps in the last two, one year, people started to see, okay, what, how, how to think how we can get the best performance possible. Perhaps we can merge solvers and like the best algorithms we have with neural networks. Um, um, if you look at this literature uh, from a perspective of learning, machine learning, you will see three types of paradigms that are used. That of supervised learning, uh, reinforcement learning, and un unsupervised learning. And I think it's it's instructive to, to look at them, their pros and cons. So supervised learning is the most popular one. So here, the idea is, okay, you get a graph, you, you, you get a graph and you treat it as a node classification problem, this, or node or edge classification problem. So basically, you have already solved the problem in a, in a training set. You, you have a lot of examples of solved instances, and then you train the neural network given the input to produce the output. Okay. If you do this, the great thing is that we know very well how to train this. It's fully differentiable. So it's optimization effectively is easy of the neural network and generally it's, it's stable to train. And people have shown that this can perform well within the same distribution. So you can generalize within the same distribution. Some very big challenges or difficulties with this approach is that, of course, you need to have solved the problem in, uh, before in order to solve it again, which is like, okay, brings the questions of what, what's the use. And you can say, you can argue that I will solve small instances and try to generalize to bigger ones, but it seems to not be possible or like, or perhaps it's, it's very limited the ability of neural networks to generalize to bigger instances that the ones that were trained. Um, another thing is, uh, uh, okay, there's another difficulty here is that in many of these problems, there, are, there can be a lot of different solutions to the problem and all of them are valid. For instance, uh, uh, a SAT formula can have many valid assignments. And if you're, you have a, a single solution or, and you train your neural network to predict that solution, you can be penalizing it when it's finding other good solutions. So that's, can also, that can also be problematic. Uh, this is an interesting reference, interesting paper that we found that's, that says that uh, actually, under some complexity theoretic assumption, it's not really feasible to to sample hard instances. Not even uh, even if you generate them yourself. So uh, and that's another reason to say uh, perhaps uh, even you cannot even generate large data sets of 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 that of hard instances. So you cannot really hope to train the neural networks to solve hard instances either. Okay, uh, the second paradigm is that of reinforcement learning. This has been uh, widely successful. Uh, and the idea here is that we will forget about differentiability. So we will uh, work with discrete functions, but we'll try to estimate the gradient, or estimate it or approximate it. So that um, uh, the good thing about this is super flexible. Uh, you can use it for even very, very complicated problems like uh, solving Go or, uh, StarCraft, it's a very flexible methodology and you can get very good results with this. At the same time, because you don't have gradients when, uh, when you're optimizing your neural network, you, uh, optimization is harder. So stability, uh, you can have training instability, you can have convergence issues, and it's it's boils a lot down to engineering. It's it, you need to make a lot of choices about how to set up this problem to get good performance, and uh, it can also be very heavily uh, resource intensive because optimization is hard. Uh, the third uh, paradigm is that of unsupervised learning. Uh, effectively, uh, what you want is you want to find a relaxation of your problem. And you want to train your neural network with respect to that relaxation. You want to minimize a differentiable loss, right? Uh, rather than working with discrete 
the discrete solutions here, for instance, is uh, the nodes in, in the set is a one, and node is not in the set is zero. You're working in a, in within the space of continuous. Uh, so the, uh, let's say the convex hull of the hypercube. And that's great because it's stable, uh, the training becomes uh, more stable. Uh, and because you don't need labels, you can generalize better. So you, you have as much data as you want effectively to train your algorithms. Uh, it's also quite uh, computationally efficient, uh, not only because you don't need labels, but because your optimization generally works faster. Uh, at the same time, if you look at the uh, literature, and this is uh, a recent review, uh, 2018, uh, focusing on machine learning for combinatorial optimization, uh, you will realize that people don't use unsupervised learning as much. And the authors argue here that it, uh, its immediate use seems difficult. And uh, the main difficulty is that uh, you of obtaining integral and valid solutions with respect to constraints. Okay, so how do you, let's break this down. So I think it's going to be familiar to a lot of you, but uh, well, um, the idea is if you're working with a relaxation, you know, you're looking over the continuous space, but you still want your solutions to be close to integral. Uh, so that when you discretize it, your cost function is similar, right? And then the, nobody guarantees if you have a, a relaxation that this will happen. Um, and this, the second problem is, of course, that you need to ensure that after discretization, your solution will satisfy the constraints. And in this case, uh, it's a, you're looking for a click, and depending on where you what you cut, where you set the threshold, you get a feasible or infeasible solution. Okay. Let's see how people try to deal with this. Uh, the, uh, the first is, uh, is the first thing you will think about if you're working with neural networks. You say, okay, I want my uh, the output, let's say the, the variable on each node that says if that node is in the set one or zero to be as close as possible to the, to the discrete values, zero or one. So I'm gonna have a function that pushes those numbers to zero or one. So, the typical uh, function that we use in deep learning is the sigmoid, so we can have a squeezed sigmoid that does this. But if you do this, effectively you're trading off differentiability for integrality because the sigmoid, this function, will be almost everywhere non-differentiable or have, it will have a very small gradient. So it doesn't work that well. The second thing you can do is you can add regularizers. And this will, for instance, an entropy regularizer will push your values towards being integral or it, you can try to enforce certain constraint. Uh, but then, uh, okay, if there, even though there's a, no, a lot of work and knowledge about regularizers, it in practice can be an art how to set it up, especially when dealing with an unfamiliar problem. And the third idea here is that, okay, you will uh, proceed as normal. You will forget about the constraints or you forget about the, the, the problem with integrality. You will solve the problem by minimizing the, the loss function. And then after thresholding, you will use a heuristic to repair your solution. Okay. And this can work quite well. Like a paper, a recent papers that get state-of-the-art performance uh, use this. Uh, but at the same time, this is kind of unsatisfactory, at least from my perspective, because nobody says that the repair heuristic and the neural network will, will play together. Uh, it's not true. These, when you're training the neural network, it doesn't know how the repair heuristic works. So, how, um, so it, what you would like to have is that the solutions that the neural network outputs are the ones exactly that could be repaired by the heuristic, but this is no, not dealt with here. Okay, so our approach is basically a, a way of a framework for setting up these problems such that you can deal with some of these drawbacks. Um, and it's inspired by a lot of classical techniques from combinatorics by, and from uh, discrete algorithms. Uh, in uh, very broad terms, uh, what you do from an algorithmic perspective is you train your neural network to minimize the differentiable loss, that's a relaxation of the cost function. And then you use some kind of decoding procedure uh, to obtain discrete solutions. So this is very similar to the relax, the solve and repair that I was saying before. But the main innovation is that uh, your the loss function is specifically designed such that the decoding works. So the neural network play to, plays together with uh, repair uh, or the solution for discretization. And yes, it has the benefits of unsupervised learning. You, generalization is generally much better 
because you have as much data as you want. Optimization can be much better uh, improved than reinforcement learning. But at the same time, it provides some form of guarantee, which is, uh, I know that you're not from, a lot of you are not from machine learning. And that, so this is a very weak guarantee for uh, people that work with algorithms, but for machine learning, this is quite strong. I, I, it guarantees that discretized solutions are valid with respect to constraints. Okay, so uh, if, you, if you optimize your neural network in this way, you know that you will get a solution that satisfies the constraint uh, under some assumption that we'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so some background. Uh, I know that um, you're probably very aware of this, but I think it's good to, to put it so that we are all on the same page and to motivate things properly. Probabilistic method, a standard method for uh, proof, uh, proof technique uh, pioneered by Erdos, but uh, invention happened earlier. And um, you, you use it to prove the existence of an object with a given property. And the way you do this, you, you create a distribution over the space of all possible objects. And then you try to think about what, what will happen if you sample an object with what probability you will get the property. And then if the probability is larger than zero, you have proven that the object must exist. And uh, the classical example is the maximum cut problem where you're looking for a set S that uh, is a subset of nodes that has a big cut. So the cluster S, the set of S, and its complement, the number of edges that go between is as large as possible. And uh, th this, in this case, you can use the probabilistic method to find, a, uh, to prove that there exists a cut of size that cuts half the edges. So that size uh, number of edges, E, divided by two. And the way you do this is you, you define a probability distribution that says, I will sample every node uh, independently with probability one half. And then you show that in expectation, if you do this, your, your set will cut half the edges. So that implies that the probability has to be larger than zero. So that's um, uh, existence proof, but you can also easily uh, turn it to a randomized algorithm that says I will gonna sample. And then if, you, if I do this enough, I will get, um, eventually get um, uh, this set, a uh, set with this guarantee. Okay. Um, and one more thing, uh, uh, if you don't like uh, randomized algorithms, you can also de-randomize this. So you don't need to sample, uh, you can have a deterministic sequential algorithm that gets the same performance. And the way you do this is you fix an ordering and you go through the nodes and you make a little check whether your conditional expectation increases or not. And uh, to have a little example to, uh, uh, here, so imagine that you have this little graph with four nodes. Now, uh, in, in gray, I have, uh, I denote random variables in this example. So, so for now, everything is uh, random variables with probability one half. You, I fixed an ordering and I visit the first node and I see that if I include that node in the set, the condition expectation will increase. So I, I add it to the set. The same thing for the second one, whereas for the third, actually the inequality is reversed. So the condition expectation would decrease if I would include it, so I, I, I take it out. And then I return uh, the first two nodes. In this case, if you do this, you know that the set that you will get, no matter the ordering, always has the cuts half the edges, at least half the edges. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, in what sense is this deterministic sequential? Because you are using randomization. Uh, so the randomization, uh, it's not. So I fixed an ordering, it's arbitrary. And I visit the nodes and I compute uh, a quantity that's uh, deterministic, the expect expected cut. So given an ordering, everything is deterministic. There's no randomization here. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, um, these are all very classical. Now, how to uh, combine this with deep learning? The idea is to, to apply this method, but to use the neural network to learn the probability distribution. So, uh, okay, so let's see schematically how this works. The, the neural network will take an uh, instance, the, the graph, and it will output a probability for every node. And we will train it in a way, and this is where you know, the magic happens, such that um, you ensure that the learned distribution will contain a small cost and feasible set with sufficient probability. And then you will decode this with uh, either by sampling uh, depending on the case or with a method of conditional expectation if you're using expectation uh, in, inside your loss. 
So this is in a very broad terms what happens. Now, uh, at the, at, I usually don't say this, but uh, since you're coming from like a more classical background, let me say that a difference here is that this neural network after, let's say you, you learn it, uh, you train it in their training set, I will gonna test it on my test set, but then I'm not gonna resolve an optimization problem or retrain it on my test set. I, I will have freeze, I will freeze it and I will test it on instances that I, it has never seen. So it's not, um, it's, it's, it's more similar to learning an algorithm like than to solving an optimization problem for every instance. And that is a, a key difference. Okay, the details, so the distribution D. In principle, you can use a lot of different distributions. Uh, we opted for the most simple one because it, it makes our life easier later on. And that's just you sampling independently every node with probability PI, which is super simple to do with a neural network. Effectively, you output a number with every, to every node and you, 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 you threshold it to go to be between zero and one. Okay, now the training. So oh, we will uh, minimize sorry, a lot. Uh, so what is this distribution? The distribution D is for what? Uh, for the probabilistic method, you need a distribution and then you need to show that when you sample from the distribution, the, pro the object that you care about, uh, the, so you will get an object that has the property that you care about with a given probability. So you need to define a probability distribution to start from. I see. So you so here, have a product distribution. That's what you're saying. Yes. So this is a product distribution. Okay. Uh, just because it makes things very easy. Uh, you could use other things, uh, but uh, I think the idea was here to push the, as much of the difficulty, difficult job to the neural network. So instead of uh, coming up with a more complicated distribution that you need to do a lot of work to derive analytical expressions for the loss functions and things you need to do, we say, okay, neural network, do what you can with this very simple distribution. Um, okay. So how do you train it? How do you define the loss function? I'm gonna talk about the unconstrained case first because it's much easier. So the idea is to try to find a loss function that, has, that satisfies the, the following property, that when I sample a set uh, from D, the distribution, I know that with probability at least D, the cost of the set will be smaller than the loss function. Okay, you can basically, this is a, a tail inequality uh, and you can, uh, any, like any tail inequality that you derive, you can use, uh, you can use it to divide, divide a loss function, but the most simple thing that you can do that will work well with the um, sequential decoding that we said is to use Markov's inequality. So if your loss function is simply the expectation of the cost function divided by one minus T, uh, equation one will hold, uh, assuming that F is positive or non-negative. Okay. Um, and the key here is that since we have a product distribution, so the distribution is very, very easy to work with. You can actually write this expectation in closed form, which is not what you would do in reinforcement learning because uh, in reinforcement, usually in deep learning, what you do is when you have this expectation is you try to estimate them from examples. Whereas here you actually have a closed form expression to that you can uh, analytically write and you can differentiate. Okay, and then uh, you can recover the set. After you train it, you can recover the set either by sampling or uh, if you use the expectation, you can use the method of conditional expectation to deterministically decode it. Okay, that's quite easy because we, there are no constraints. So what happens if you do have constraints? Uh, we thought about two ways of dealing with them. Uh, the first is to use a penalty loss. So what you do is you take your cost function f and you change it. I will gonna call it the penalized cost function that just adds something to it that makes its value to be very large when your, when your constraint is not satisfied. And then if you take the expectation of this, we call it the probabilistic penalty loss, that will be simply the expectation of the original cost function plus Vita times the probability that S is not in Omega. And uh, if you can derive analytically a differentiable upper bound for this uh, probability, then you you can use it as a loss function uh, and you can optimize. Um, now the guarantee that you get is the following. Um, effectively, um, that if you your loss function falls sufficiently, 
and is smaller than one minus t times vita, where vita is an upper bound, is a uniform upper bound on your cost function. Then you know that with probability at least t, there a set that you sample from the distribution will be long, will abide with the constraint, and at the same time, its loss function will be small enough. And that's not very difficult to derive. Actually, it's, a, it's simply uni a union bound between two events. Um, okay, this is nice. Uh, the, the difficulty here is that you need to have a, a, an expression for this probability, but there is another way that only works for linear box constraints. So a linear box constraint has this form. So you have the sum of the elements. So you associate like a constant, a scalar with every element of the set and you need the sum of the scalars to be in some interval. In this case, what we do is you know, this, uh, what we call a renormalization method. So the idea here is that you take the probabilities that the neural network outputs and then you rescale them uh, such that the constraint is satisfied in expectation. So what you do is I'm going to set uh, the probability such that uh, on average, the, uh, what the constraint will fall exactly in the middle of this interval. And you can do this with a nonlinear scaling. This is very simple to achieve. It's an iterative method that converges to the, to the right of scaling. Um, and if you do this, you can get the following thing. You don't need any more to have the probability to, to have an analytical, ex analytical expression for this probability. Uh, what you do is you, you, you derive a loss function for the unconstrained problem, uh, L. So for instance, this could be the expectation is, or, or it could be some other tail inequality. And then you say that if under this renormalization, I know that my constraint will also be satisfied but and the only thing I pay is that my probability is reduced by a little bit, and this is uh, effectively bounding the probability that if I um, uh, if I sample, uh, then this will this uh, constraint this this sum here will fall outside of this interval. So this is uh, you pay you can increase basically a little bit tough in order to deal with it. Okay, two examples. This is the maximum click problem that I told you about. You're looking for a, a click of maximum size and the graph partitioning problem. So here, because graph partitioning, gra graph, the graph cut, um, the minimum cut problems are polynomial time, we said, okay, let's add um, a constraint to it. We had two choices, uh, cardinality or volume constraint, but we wanted to, to compare with the uh, local graph clustering method. So we said, okay, let's put volume. Uh, so we have uh, basically, uh, um, finding the minimum cut subject to the volume being in a given range. This is not exactly like minimizing conductance, but it's similar because what you can do is conductance is the ratio between the, the cut and the volume. So you can say, I will minimize the cut for a given volume and I will scan across all volumes. And then uh, I will select the best and that will be give me a solution to the, uh, to the problem of minimizing conductance. I say that will, because it will come later and I know that we haven't uh, done in the audience. So. Okay, now uh, maximum click, the loss function. Uh, this is how we set it up. So we have a constraint that your set is a click and we need to minimize the neg uh, something. So it's the negative weight. And just to work with weighted graphs, instead of working the cardinality, we have here the number of uh, or the weights internally in the click. And okay, you need non-negative so you can rescale it. Uh, no, shift it, not rescale it with a gamma. And you get, if you do the math, you do this, you get this expression. And what's interesting about this is, uh, okay, for it contains a term that is, is a quadratic term that's defined on the edges. And here's a term that is not on the complement graph, so non edges. And um, uh, it's a linear time to compute on the number of edges because this you can easily uh, write it as a function of the edges that, that exist rather than on the non edges. So it's it also works effectively for efficiently for sparse graphs. And the guarantee that you get is that uh, if you minimize your loss sufficiently uh, sufficiently, then uh, with probability at least t, your set will be a click when you sample from this distribution and its uh, its weight will be larger than this. So if your click, your loss is sufficiently small, this will be close to gamma, which is an upper bound for the cost function. May I ask a, a, another question, please? Yes. Uh, another question. So uh, how is, is N 
you tend into infinity or is there n any determined how do you determine n because what is uh, sorry doing, what is n uh, well you are doing this gradually you're computing the conditional expectations gradually so how how many conditional expectations are you calculating i guess it's yes. the number of edges or i will tell you so uh it depends so okay with this you can either sample or you can use this method of conditional expectation if you use method the method of conditional expectation you need to uh, uh, basically compute the conditional expectation once for every node but there are two optimizations that you can do which would imply uh, n times e times number of edges complexity but there are two things you can do first that because Every subset of a click is like has this click has this matroid property. So if every subset of a click is also a click. So whenever you encounter a node, if it doesn't belong to the click, so basically if you check locally that uh, the constraint is violated, which is very simple to do, um, you can directly ignore it. You can uh, disregard it. So you didn't need to check. And also in the computation, there are things that you can reuse because when you're computing these conditional expectations, so it's it's faster. I don't have an upper bound for the for the decoding um, complexity uh, for this problem, but uh, yeah, it's 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 not that bad. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, okay, uh, graph partitioning. This is uh, the the formulation of the problem. We have a volume constraint um, that's in an interval, and we have the the cut, and we use this renormalization method which allows us to that basically to use as a loss this the simply expectation of the cost which is the has this nice simple expression and the guarantee that you get is that the cut will be at most the loss divided by one minus t uh, and the constraint will be satisfied with this probability so the probability depends on uh, you can choose t such that uh, uh that this is small enough and this is you know this does not depend on learning this is already known from scratch because it's the length of the interval and the degrees okay now let's put this to the test let's see what happens if you try uh, to, to use this um yes i was talking about graph partitioning but i will evaluate uh, compared to local graph clustering uh, because there are a lot more like, algorithms out there for this and we wanted to to compare to different things so um we picked uh, solutions from different uh, literatures, neural networks, of course, because we, we are in this, uh, liter this domain, but at the same time, heuristics, approximation algorithms, and solvers. Uh, and in terms of solvers, we, we tried to, to, we, to, to look at uh, MIP solvers that are very efficient in practice. CPC is an open source uh, solver by Google. Uh, and Grobi 9 is, I think, is the, the it's highly optimized as a commercial solver. That's uh, it's really impressive, actually. Data sets, real world data sets, and at the same time, hard instances. Uh, and just uh, to, to make it clear here, here, so every data set has a collection of graphs, and we split it in two. We have the training set and the test set. We train at the training set and we evaluate on the test set, right? So the, the neural network has never seen. It has learned an algorithm, and you, 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 it's called to, to, to make a prediction on an instance that it hasn't seen. And architecture, um, this is, uh, okay, it's a little bit perhaps technical for this audience, but uh, it's a kind of standard neural network uh, with uh, like uh, Nick's tricks that uh, we know. Uh, the only thing that's a little bit special for neural networks is that uh, we use, um, so we use a special random uh, node feature. So the neural networks actually, the GNNs are very sensitive to the type of node features they have. Um, and it's in that literature, yeah, it's known that uh, neural, GNNs without node features. So basically just when they just give, are given the graph, they're not very strong. There, there are a lot of problems that they cannot solve. Uh, whereas you know, actually in, in one of my previous papers, I showed that if their features are sufficiently diverse, you, you, they can be as equivalent as a Turing machine on the same input. Uh, so they, uh, so having powerful, uh, good uh, features is important. At, and at the same time, uh, it's good to have a way to, to, to focus the attention of the neural network in different areas of the graph so that you, you can run, you can basically trade off computational time for approximation for the quality of the results that you get. 
So what we said is that we'll select a random node similar to local graph clustering, and we'll put a one on that node and zero everywhere else. And that you know allows us to basically run the neural network with many inputs and get different distributions. Okay, the results, they're a uh, mouthful, but let me try to break them down. I'm look, um, we're looking here at approximation ratios. These are numbers from zero to one. A one is optimal solution. And uh, for instance, 0 0.5 is you have a, you're twice worse than the optimal. Uh, and I have in, in the parentheses, this is uh, the execution time. This is the number of seconds per graph that you're uh, spending. And these are three data sets from simpler to more complicated. In the first um, um, few rows, we have neural networks. Um, I, I was really positively surprised when I first saw the results because I, it's, it seems that for simpler cases, you can solve the problem optimally with neural networks. Uh, and even in the harder cases, uh, it's, it's not that bad. 92% approximation ratio, it was, uh, or 94 if you're going for the most accurate version. Uh, by the way, I'm, here I'm showing uh, many many of these methods you can use them in a in a slow and accurate or fast and uh, you know uh, rough uh, approach. So I'm, I'm, we're showing different types of instantiations. Uh, I think it's in interesting to consider this BOMS and MS. This is the same neural network, exactly the same setup, but instead of using this our, our loss, basically we use things that people have proposed in the literature for finding clicks, and these are. Uh, um, work quite well for simple instances for but what happens is that if you go to harder cases they violate the constraint and i will show you a result later um, of, of how bad this is uh, in the middle we have approximation algorithms and uh, greedy algorithms uh, here uh, this is the network x uh, it's a standard uh, mis uh, this is the maximum dependent set uh, algorithm for uh, for this and it doesn't work that well. You see, there is a it falls behind. Um, uh, whereas, if, if you look at more uh, recent and highly and optimized greedy algorithms, what they do is they can solve the problem uh, worse in terms of accuracy in of quality, but faster. So they are also kind of good. They are good solutions. And the, and the bottom we have uh, MIP solvers, uh, CBC uh, struggles. Uh, especially when you go to harder and bigger instances. Whereas Grobi, this is a really amazing. It can solve everything to optimality, uh, even though it starts to slow down. And you will see in a minute what happens if you go to slightly larger uh, instances. Uh, you really see the, the problem with scalability. I could ask quickly, how big are the cliques? Like how many vertices are you finding in these graphs? Uh, they're, they're not that big. Uh, maybe, uh, I think on average it's like 50 around that size. So yeah, I know that it's a, a, a fixed parameter tractable. So it's polynomial time if the number, the size of the click uh, is not uh, n. Yeah, but that but, doesn't help you do it in a second. So <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's still, um, OK. Uh, perhaps I, I will skip this. I want to show you uh, some ablation study. Um, so this is uh, the percentage of uh, the test instances where the, the constraint was violated. And by construction, our method does not violate the constraint. But if you if you use another loss, for instance, on Twitter, around 80% of the cases, the constraint was violated. So that's uh, uh, a big uh, improvement. And this is you know to advocate for learning because somebody could say that all the heavy lifting is happening from the de-randomization procedure. And to test this, we have random probabilities. And we compare if you learn, and this is a, um, a different data set, a different uh, instance, uh, and uh, you are improving. I mean, you, the, this the randomization procedure helps, but you can improve the results by learning. OK, now to local graph clustering. I'm showing here contactants. So contactants, you need to be as small as possible. And uh, we have three data sets, very, very small, 20 nodes. This is like 20 nodes. These are hundreds of nodes. And this is on average 7,000 nodes. Um, what happens here uh, is that you see that there's a trade off. So Erdos GNN and L1, L2 GNN, they differ in the loss function. This is if you use standard relaxations of the cut, this is the L1 and L2 relaxation. And what happens here is that uh, you see that 
the Erdos method is significantly slower because you have to do this decoding, which is a sequential decoding procedure. But it's it can be up to a factor of two more more uh, uh, give you better conductance by a factor of two. And okay, this this time is slower. <laughs> it's by fact by an order of magnitude, but it's still faster uh, by. Uh, Approximation by approximation algorithms, right? Okay, we don't get guarantees, but in practice, we can get quite good results. And this is what happens with Kurobi. In the smaller cases, you know, it, it completely solves the problem. It, it's uh, in 0 0.16 seconds, it finds the uh, amazing uh, cluster uh, with very good conductance. But if you go to thousands of nodes, you, it really, no matter how much time we gave it, it couldn't really find anything. So you see that. Um, yeah, you know, MIP solvers really struggle, even if they're heavily optimized. Okay, this is my, I think my last slide. Let me try to sum up. Uh, and for machine learning and supervised learning, like basically solving the problem without labeled data is considered the long-term goal. Uh, but uh, in terms of combinatorial optimization and reasoning, what seems to happen, and it, is, uh, is that uh, the algorithms learned by unsupervised learning do not uh, give guarantees, uh, neither in, of, in terms of optimality or feasibility. And you know, uh, this uh, Benjo and Tal they argue that you know this should be a priority. And what we have here is you know we we bring some ideas from combinatorics uh, in order to to make part of this uh, desirable uh, property true, uh, in, in the sense that we can now um, ensure the feasibility of solutions for various problems. And you, in practice, it works quite well. Uh, now, okay, let's have a reality check. Uh, first is, in practice, should I use this? Well, not yet. Um, uh, if you have small small problems, MIP solvers are really very good. If you care, uh, have very large instances, get the algorithms, especially when you know people have worked on the problem for a long time, they're still uh, one of the very competitive. Uh, it's also this approach is it's only feasible is when you can have analytical expressions for the loss and the constraints. Uh, so if you want to deal with, for instance, you want to enforce constraints, I want to find a tree or uh, I want to find a Hamiltonian cycle or like something more complicated. It's not really obvious how to, to do this. And you know we're, we're still far from deriving optimality guarantees. So this is something that is really lacking. Okay. Um, okay, let me close here. Um, this is, I have to say, you know, a lot of um, uh, this work was done by Nikos. He's my PhD student and, you know, I should, uh, I'm really happy to, to have him and to work with him. So uh, big thanks for that. Uh, and if you want, if you, if you, I don't know, if you want to see how it works, we have the code uh, open source on GitHub. So you can try it out and, uh, you know, interact with it. Yes, so I'll, I'll be very happy to, to, to take your questions and discuss about challenges okay. and yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so I have one question, right? So you started uh, this graph neural net with, you know, uh, uh, you know, the reason that you like is that you can reason, right? Yes. Okay, so what can you reason about? Exactly. Yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult to say what it, uh, what it means. Uh, I'm thinking of it as, learning algorithms in a way. And I'm thinking about it as like, trying to enforce, uh, for instance, for me, like enforcing constraints is a type of uh, something that you would expect from a reasoning, from an agent that can do some reasoning. But uh, this is not a, the, a very, Right. I don't know. So here is uh, one thing that I'm uh, wondering. Like we know that for, you know, some of these combinatorial optimization problems, right? Greedy is the, you know, at least for the worst case, it is optimal, right? Um, and uh, is there any hope to show that, you know, these learning algorithms are going to do something like greedy? Well, um, okay. It depends on the problem, I guess. Uh, greedy can work very well for certain problems. Uh, first is, okay, for in terms of complex um, expressivity, um, you can uh, emulate greedy with uh, with these networks. So then in a sense, yes. 
but then I guess I think when you're talking about deep learning, you don't ever care about worst case performance. It's always right. an expectation. So it's always about what kind of result are you going to get uh, the average case complexity, uh, the average case uh, performance. So it's different. Uh, yes. Uh, right. So what I'm saying is that you're cooking up, you know, uh, a loss function and, uh, and a regularizer, right? And uh, the, you know what, what I'm hoping is that uh, okay so is, is it possible because as you said right so you can actually uh, have a, a graph neural net that emulates exactly grid and yeah. well that is probably of no use to learning because it, it, there is no learning happening right so it is just emulating right. Grid, right on the other hand you can say well I, I'm going to actually have this uh, loss functions and uh, uh, and then I'm going to train but uh maybe can i say anything about you know what what is this thing learning and uh and that's another know. big problem here right that we don't know what it's learned being learned okay. i see uh we, we, we never know we can only say uh, we can in the best case you can have generalization error guarantees that you say okay if you see this expectation of this performance in in, in test uh, but even that is very difficult. Uh, no, uh, in practice, it's not difficult, right? You have a validation set, and if it's yeah, big it enough, is. you can get a bound. But um, in theory, it's hard. Um, yeah. So it's you, there are a lot of limitations, as you said. Uh, interpretability: what what is being learned? You don't have optimality guarantees in terms of the worst case. Right. So it's uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to ask: what have you or what what sort of thoughts have you used or how have you changed looking into the order in which you're doing the sequential rounding like do you fix it a priori do you pick a random order do you no, base no. it on the probabilities that you get of out course. yeah yeah so we of course we, we wanted to get as good performance as we could so we we order things according to the probability and then that helps also to to be a little bit faster because eventually you don't have to check anymore so which but, order is better? Is it from like things near a half to near zero one or the other way? Uh, I think in terms of speed, uh, it's uh, from starting from one and going down, but uh, okay. yeah, I don't know. Maybe there are, there are better, better methods. Uh, I could imagine there, right? it might also affect the quality of the result that you get. It does. Uh, in fact, you know, we tried different things. Uh, one of these was to try different orderings, swap a little bit the orderings, and then try a few times, and then you can trade off a little bit of computation time for the, for for quality, and it can help. Um, in in practice, in your in in deep learning, you usually do some kind of a beam search, just so like a local search, uh, and that helps more. But we wanted to be as close as possible to the to the theory, so we didn't uh, we didn't do it. Cool. Thanks. Yes. So yes. So I think my uh, last question. Okay. Uh, yes. When you say something about guarantees, uh, yes, I'm not in the in the area, but it seems to me that guarantees are are given in probability. So maybe you can tell me something. So. Is it that you find that the probability is bigger than zero with high probability? So that. So, well, effectively, uh, here you can see it as that your loss function is the probability that uh, that an event will happen, and you try to maximize this probability. This, I think, this is kind of equivalent. Um, uh, so, yes. Yeah. What did the one want to say something? I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, but in terms of, I, because I think this here, the audience is, uh, is perhaps the right audience for this. Uh, I would like to say uh, it's a big question how to come up with optimality guarantees in this setup. And um, if you have some ideas, I would be very interested to discuss because it's, it's it's a little bit it's tricky because you know usually when you have approximation algorithms, 
the the whole key is that you, in your relaxation, you know that you will solve it optimally, so you you will you will get a lower bound for the cost. So then you can use this to. But here you don't know whether like your function is not convex. It's like that you're minimizing. You have no guarantee about what's going to be the the cost of the optimal solution. Right. So you only have a guarantee about feasibility, right? You only have a guarantee about feasibility. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I forgot. I remember what I wanted to say, because now actually we're working with satisfiability problems, and there, uh, because you know we th there are two versions, like the the one that is the optimization version or the decision version, and then uh, if you wanted to solve the decision version, any any non-zero, like any epsilon probability, is enough to guarantee that this is a satisfiable instance. So there, you know, you can really <laughs> find any. Uh, 0 0.0001 probability, and that's enough. Um, so that's, yeah, it depends what you want to do. Um, right. Yeah, it seems that, uh, yeah, there are many theoretical open questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, and if you, if you have ideas of like uh, tools from a uh, classical discrete algorithm optimization and so on that are that can also be be transferred, I I'm trying to to understand because it seems to me when I'm, uh, that a lot of the tools are primarily designed to give guarantees, and then if you strip this out, you say okay I'm going to forgo guarantees because I cannot do this uh, then. It's not clear what you can still reuse. Um, yeah, but the thing that comes to mind is this: a lot of work that Afonso Bandiera has been doing, um, which I don't know if you're familiar with. On you know, finding, trying to find dual certificates when mm. they solve optimization problems, and there, he's been looking at a lot of random instances, but sort of the same code can be used um he's not far from you he's at ETH zurich so oh. okay that. i will check this see specifically okay but one could imagine that your algorithms might come up with solutions that then some of Either his techniques could find a dual, or you could, you know, turn his techniques into something you can do with a graph neural net and try to find some dual certificates. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I don't know much about this, but uh, I can check it out, especially since he's close. close by. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't know if that helps in the COVID era, but in a few months. <laughs> that yeah. Help. Yes. 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 Sure. Great. So. I think it was on time. Yes, very good. Thank you. I'll send you the Zoom link for short chat and then we can have after. Thank you. Thank you very good. much. Yes. Awesome to present to you and to talk to you. And uh, have a nice day. day. And perhaps we'll talk with some of you a bit yeah. more. OK, take care. Uh, yes. Early, I'll send the link. Yes.